Thank you so much, everyone. We're so happy to have you here today. And today is part of our research ready series where we host researchers to talk about their research. So today we'll be talking about cardiovascular risk factors and dementia with researcher Ellen Rowe. So hi everyone, my name is Avery and I'm the Provincial Coordinator for Knowledge Mobilization with the Alzheimer's Society of BC. So at the Society, we receive many questions about research related to dementia and we're always looking for ways to act as a knowledge translator and help bring research findings into the hands of knowledge users like yourselves. So today we're thrilled to be hosting a local researcher, Ellen Rowe. So she's currently in the second year of her PhD in pathology and lab medicine at UBC, supervised by Dr. Cheryl Wellington. Her project is focused on understanding how risk factors tie into the development of late onset Alzheimer's disease and exploring new markers in the blood that might identify those at risk. So thank you so much, Ellen, and feel free to take it from here. Amazing. Thank you so much for that introduction, Avery. Um, so I'll, I'll just launch right in. I wanted to start um, with an overview. I'm, I'm so thankful to be here. So thank you everyone for attending. This is my first webinar. Um, I think my first webinar ever. Um, I was going to say my first one with the Alzheimer's Society. Um, but as promised today, I'll be unpacking the relationship between cardiovascular risk factors and dementia. So it's not going to be a lot about my own research. It's more looking at the whole field and what we're learning um, in the research world about how all, all of these things are connected. So I'll start off my talk with the different types of dementia and their overlap. And then I'll get into how brain and blood vessel health are very closely related and how when stuff goes wrong in blood vessel health, this can lead to things that contribute to dementia. Then I will unpack uh, what it means to be a cardiovascular risk factor and how a few different cardiovascular risk factors actually tie in to different types of dementia. And then I'll touch on lifestyle changes to decrease risk if you do have some of these risk factors. And I'll wrap it up with a little bit of talk about my own PhD project. So again, thank you all for joining me. I'm very excited about this. So we'll dive right in here with types of dementia, their differences and their overlap. And I will give everyone a warning here. I'll, I will get pretty deep into um, kind of the biology and what all the cells are doing behind, but I do my best to walk everyone through different cell types and, and give everyone a bit of a preface to all of the biology that I'll cover, but feel free to drop any questions in the chat box. I should have some time at the end if anything is unclear to, to clarify things. So we'll dive right in. So, as I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, dementia is defined by the impaired ability to think, remember, or make decisions. And dementia is often used as an umbrella term to describe the many different diseases that fall under dementia. So, these include vascular dementia, Alzheimer's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and Lewy body dementia, which is also known as Parkinson's dementia. And each of these diseases are defined by subtle cognitive differences. Um, which can be detected by doctors. They can sometimes tease apart these cognitive differences to make a diagnosis, but really they're best defined by the artifacts or pathology that we see in the brains of people affected by these diseases. And today I'll be focusing on vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease because I had to keep the talk somewhat focused. I tried to cover a lot here, but there are some relationships with these other types of dementia as well. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. All right, so starting off with Alzheimer's disease, which is defined by the presence of two main hallmarks in the brain. So these are these plaques that form outside of the cells in the brain, and these are made up of a protein fragment called amyloid beta. And the other hallmark is these tau neurofibrillary tangles, and these happen inside of neurons, and it's when everything kind of just gets tangled up inside of the neuron, which causes it to not function very properly, and can actually die. And neurons are our cells in the brain, and I'll unpack this a bit more later, but you can just think of these neurofibrillary tangles happen in cells. And I don't talk much about tau in this talk, but I'm happy to answer any questions about these tangles at the end. So importantly, when we think about Alzheimer's disease, we should be aware that about 95% of cases are classified as sporadic, 
meaning that the disease can develop in some people during old age without a known cause, and it's not directly caused by genetics or the genes that you inherit. So this is in contrast to familial cases of Alzheimer's disease, which are caused by a genetic mutation. And these familial cases, the other about 5%, um, in these cases, the cognitive decline typically starts earlier in life, and we sometimes call this type of Alzheimer's early onset Alzheimer's. But we actually don't know what causes the late onset or sporadic Alzheimer's disease. But we have gained some insights into the course of the disease by looking or by monitoring people who develop Alzheimer's. And it's possible to measure these two hallmarks, the amyloid and tau, in the blood and cerebrospinal fluid of individuals who are diagnosed, and to actually visualize the amyloid depositing and the tau tangles happening in people using imaging techniques. Uh, and you can actually track these changes over the course of the disease. And this sort of tracking led to this picture of the amyloid cascade hypothesis, which has really governed the field for many decades, as we see that over time, um, this is like the time course of someone diagnosed uh, with late onset Alzheimer's disease at the end. So first we see this spike in amyloid, um, we see these amyloid deposits in the brain, and then after we see the tau start to form, and then we see the brain shrinkage, which is caused by cell death inside of the brain. And then after all of these two things happen, we start to see the changes in memory and then clinical function. So this picture here really led researchers to think, okay, it's amyloid causing everything downstream. We need to target amyloid. And because of this, most drugs aimed to uh, develop to treat Alzheimer's disease or to try to do so, have targeted amyloid trying to clear it or stop it from, from forming. But so far, as I'm sure everyone knows, there hasn't been a successful one on the market that actually can um, change cognitive symptoms at the end. So we can clear amyloid, but it's not changing anything. So this leads me to point out that we actually don't know what causes this increase in amyloid in the first place. And maybe we need to be focusing on something upstream for treatment. Um, but we have gained some insight into potential causes of this amyloid cascade by looking at factors that increase the risk of developing Alzheimer's disease, which include, of course, increasing age, this um, genetic factor called ApoE epsilon 4. So the gene is called ApoE, and the version of the gene that increases risk is called epsilon 4. And um, cardiovascular risk factors, which will be the main focus of my talk today. So on the other hand, vascular dementia is defined by different artifacts that we see in the brain, which can either be hemorrhages, so the bursting of the blood vessels that causes bleeding in the brain, or infarcts, which is when cells die because the blood supply that has all the nutrients and oxygen that the cells in your brain need to survive gets blocked by something like a blood clot or the stiffening and narrowing of the artery, which could be due to atherosclerosis, and I'll unpack this um, later on in my talk. But we can actually visualize these hallmarks in people while they're alive using an imaging technique called MRI. And here you can see this is as if we're looking down at someone's brain. These little black dots here are actually signs of small bleeds or micro hemorrhages in the brain. Whereas over here, this big white area is an infarct. So this is this was due to a large stroke where blood supply was blocked off, causing a lot of the cells in the brain to die. So we can actually see these and monitor these in patients, um, and that helps in diagnosis. But it's pretty well established that um, vascular dementia is caused by reduced blood flow or stroke. And this is in line with the main risk factors for vascular dementia, which include clotting disorders, so that could stop the blood flow, and also cardiovascular risk factors. So that kind of overlaps with Alzheimer's, and we'll start to unpack all of that overlap in this talk. So although we like to nicely slot diseases into diagnosis boxes, the reality is a lot more complicated, and most dementia is considered mixed dementia, showing signs of many different diseases at the same time. So in a study done in 2017, um, a group looked at the brains of 1,079 people affected by dementia and actually found over 230 different combinations of pathologies or those artifacts in the brain some of which included those plaques, the tangles, microbleeds, infarcts, and hallmarks of the other two types of dementia that I mentioned at the beginning. 
And a really common one to see is the plaques and tangles characteristic of Alzheimer's disease alongside vascular hallmarks like microbleeds or infarcts. And in fact, a lot of studies have taken a similar approach to looking at the overlap of different pathologies. And they found that between 60 to 90% of individuals with Alzheimer's disease also have blood vessel pathology. And this really blurs the line between the diagnosis of pure Alzheimer's disease and pure vascular dementia and indicates that there might be some overlap in how these two diseases develop. And as you'll see, there are a lot of common threads between the two, which can trace back to cardiovascular risk factors. So now getting into the relationship between dementia and brain health, really, and vascular health. So it wouldn't be a science talk about the brain if I didn't start with neurons. And I've already kind of mentioned them and glossed over them, but here I'll unpack this a little bit more. So there are an astounding number of neurons in the brain, about 100 billion, which is hard to conceptualize. It's like half of all of the stars in the Milky Way, which again is still hard to conceptualize. And what's even more astonishing is that all of these 100 billion neurons make about 125 trillion connections between them, um, or synapses. And so neurons are the main cell type that we think about in the brain, probably because these are the cells that actually drive everything behind our thoughts and our memory and our consciousness. So these cells are information messengers that communicate through electrical signals and chemicals called neurotransmitters that cross the little gaps between neurons. So you can see we've zoomed in here to where one neuron is contacting the other, and there's this little gap here. And so one neuron can send chemicals across this gap called neurotransmitters um, to the other neuron to evoke an electric potential in that neuron, and that is really how neurons communicate. And over here on this side, you can see a photo from the Human Connectome Project which shows the mind-blowing extent. So in this project, they've tried to map out all of the connections in the brain, and it is pretty amazing, but definitely a little bit beyond my area of expertise. Um, but importantly for this talk, a common thread between all dementia types is the death of neurons, so these information messengers, or their impaired communication, so they're not able to communicate properly. And of course, death and impaired communication go hand in hand, but ultimately, without functional neurons, we can't produce functional thoughts. So keeping the neurons functional is the even more impressive, in my opinion anyway, there's about approximately 700 kilometers worth of blood vessels in the human brain. So here in this diagram, someone has mapped out um, all of the blood vessels in the human brain. And if you zoom in, you can see these larger arteries. So these are the vessels um, that carry oxygenated blood from the heart. These branch out into tiny little branches of capillaries, which are the really small blood vessels that come in closer contact with the neurons. And then these gradually change into the blue here, the veins where we get the transport of deoxygenated blood back to the heart and, and so on and so forth. So these vessels have a lot of functions in the brain including providing the nutrient, nutrients and oxygen that the neurons need to make energy and function properly. They maintain a tight barrier, so only certain things can enter the brain, and they play a big role in clearing waste. So these are all functions that I will unpack shortly as they relate to the development of dementia. So reinforcing the importance of blood vessels is the fact that the average distance between any neuron in the brain and its closest blood vessel is about 23 micrometers. And so this is about a quarter of the width of a strand of hair. So all neurons are really, really close by to blood vessels because they're so important in maintaining their health. So like I said, I'm going to get down to the cellular level in this talk and I, because I really want to dig into the functions of the blood vessels and how they can change in health and disease. So your whole body is made up of individual cells, and these cells can be grouped into types based on their location and the job that they do. So, of course, um, in the brain, we have neurons, which I've already mentioned. These are the information messengers. And, but these aren't the only types of cells in the brain. There are a lot of other cells doing different jobs. One of these is smooth muscle cells. And now these aren't exclusive to the brain. They're found all over the body, but they do have an important job in the brain. So smooth muscle cells are involuntary muscle cells, meaning that you can't consciously control them like your skeletal muscle cells when you flex. That 
is not an involuntary smooth muscle cell. That is a skeletal muscle cell. But smooth muscle cells do a lot of important jobs like controlling how much your blood vessels dilate or contract, and they control your digestive system as well, among many other things. So in your brain, these cells move big blood vessels like arteries to change blood flow and clear waste to some extent. We also have pericytes, not to be confused with parasites, um, but I like to think of these as the smooth muscle cells little brother because we can find these parasites along the smaller capillaries in the brain, not the larger arteries where the smooth muscle cells are, but once we get that branching off, we see, start to see parasites. And these have some role in controlling blood flow as we're learning, but they also have distinct roles from their big brother in that they help maintain the blood brain barrier, which I will unpack shortly. We're continuing to learn a lot about these parasites. We don't understand them completely yet, um, but we're learning a lot really every couple of months about these. It seems like a new crazy finding comes out. So next we have astrocytes, and I like to think of these as all around supporting cells. Now these cells are exclusive to the brain and they can support neurons by clearing waste and they reinforce the blood brain barrier as well. And finally, we have endothelial cells. And these are the cells lining all of the blood vessels in the body. So these are the cells that are actually in contact with your blood, providing a barrier between your blood and, and the rest of your tissue. So the endothelial cells in the brain are a bit specialized because they're the first line of defense in the blood brain barrier. And so they, they're a little bit different than just regular old endothelial cells. So from here on out, I'll be using these little cartoon cells to explain the functions of the blood vessels in the brain that I mentioned and how when they go wrong, it can actually be really bad for the neurons. So I'll start with neurovascular coupling, which is a complicated way to say the communication between neurons and the blood vessels. And I'll explain how this can drive blood flow into the brain. So Communication between neurons takes a lot of energy. They have to produce these electrical signals and send chemicals between each other. And in fact, they use so much energy that it's estimated that about 20% of all of the body's energy gets routed to the brain. And to get this energy, they need to communicate with the blood vessels because the oxygen and the nutrients that they need are in the blood. So here I've made a diagram um, of what a vessel might look like. So on the left side here, I have a capillary so you've got the endothelial cells lining the blood vessel, supported by the little parasites and astrocyte. And then on the right side here, I've modeled an artery. So you have the endothelial cells supported by the smooth muscle cells and the astrocyte. And when neurons need energy, they can actually send chemical messages right to the parasites or smooth muscle cells to cause the blood vessel to expand or they can communicate through endothelial cells and astrocytes, which then send on messages to pericytes and smooth muscle cells. So there's a lot of complicated communication going on here. But ultimately, these signals cause the blood vessel to dilate, to open up, and this increases the availability of oxygen and nutrients to the neurons, which are then transported across the blood-brain barrier so the neurons can use this to make the energy that they need. And I'm sure everyone can appreciate that this is a pretty fine-tuned process, and when it goes wrong, there can be some major consequences. So, in a study done in 2017 that looked at 4,759 individuals, the researchers found that lower blood flow to the brain actually increased the risk of dementia, and not just vascular dementia, but all types of dementia. And actually, that lower blood flow accelerated cognitive decline. And many studies since then have found the same or similar trends, and this really makes sense and is to be expected because when there aren't enough nutrients and oxygen getting to the brain, the cells can start to die, including those information messengers, the neurons. And this is really the basis of vascular dementia, but as I mentioned, it can extend to other dementias as well. And really, it can be directly related to Alzheimer's disease because when neurons are deprived of the energy or, or the nutrients and oxygen that they need to make their energy, they can get really stressed out. And when neurons get stressed out, we're finding that that's when they, which, which could be, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. Um, when they don't have enough energy because there's a blockage in the blood vessel or you have arterial stiffening, so the blood vessel isn't able to respond to the needs of the neurons as much, the neurons can get stressed out. 
and that can cause them to actually start pumping out the amyloid beta, which is that fragment of the protein that starts creating the plaques in the brain. So this could really be something upstream of the amyloid cascade hypothesis, a reduction in cerebral blood flow that actually leads to everything else that happens later and ultimately ends up um, resulting in dementia. So as I've mentioned quite a few times, the blood-brain barrier is also critical in keeping the brain healthy. And in this diagram, I'm showing a cross-section of a blood vessel. So we're looking directly into the blood vessel. And you can see here that the endothelial cells are lining, they're in contact with the blood. Then we have the supporting parasite and the astrocytes making some contact with this unit as well. So um, while the endothelial cells are the first line of defense, the parasites and astrocytes actually cause the endothelial cells to form these little black things. And these aren't gaps. These are meant to show like tight junctions between um, the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells get nestled up really close together and actually bind together almost um, to really exclude anything from just leaking through. And that's a special characteristic of the blood-brain barrier. So this ultimately um, lets the brain uptake some things from the blood but keeps other things out. And so there are lots of different things in the blood. And as with any intact endothelial barrier anywhere around the body, the blood-brain barrier excludes blood cells from just leaking through because this would be a bleed. Um, and as I've mentioned, the blood-brain barrier can let nutrients and oxygen through to feed the neurons. But where it's really specialized is that it can exclude any microbes or germs in the bloodstream. And it can exclude proteins um, in the blood that the brain wouldn't recognize. So another aside here is that blood-brain barrier can also be a big hurdle for getting drugs that treat brain diseases into the brain. And this is something that all researchers working to develop drugs for brain diseases need to consider. So just something to keep in mind, a cool fact. Um, so when the blood-brain barrier gets disrupted, which could be because the vessel lost its supporting parasite or astrocyte, or because the endothelial cells are damaged or not working properly, um, microbes and foreign proteins from the blood can actually enter the brain. And when this happens, immune cells in the brain start to go on high alert because it's the immune cell's job to recognize anything that shouldn't be in the body or shouldn't be in a place where it's found and to attack those things and to get rid of them. And if this happens over a long period of time, so if you just have a little bit of a leak in your blood-brain barrier, your immune cells will always be on high alert. And that kind of stress will really stress out the neurons as well, just like not getting enough nutrients or oxygen. And that causes them to start pumping out amyloid beta as well, which can then, of course, lead to the plaques. And I'll also note here that a similar thing happens when there's a micro hemorrhage in vascular dementia. So the whole blood vessel ruptures and releases everything into the brain. Um, but that's a more extreme case where it'll kind of just wash out and kill a bunch of the neurons in the localized area but there might still be um, an immune response that continues later on. Um, so yeah, a link to both vascular dementia and Alzheimer's again here. So in the past year, there's been even more evidence published supporting the link of a leaky blood-brain barrier to Alzheimer's disease by looking at main risk factors. So in one study, researchers found evidence that the blood-brain barrier breaks down with aging. And in this study, they injected a radioactive tracer into the blood of mice and then looked at their brains um, to see how much of this tracer got in, so how much leaked from the blood vessel. And they looked at their brains and you can see a slice of a brain here and any bright color into the red zone indicates that there was leakage and anything dark indicates that there wasn't. So you can see that in these aged mice, which were 22 months old, which in human years is around 65, um, these mice had a lot more stuff leaking through. You can see more patchy light colors than the three month old mice, which were like around 20 years old in human years. So this age related breakdown could certainly tie into the development of dementia in old age. And another study, oops, Another study focused on the genetic risk factor um, of ApoE, that epsilon-4 allele of ApoE. And here the researchers injected a tracer into the blood of humans, which could then be visualized using MRI imaging. 
And so that's kind of what it looks like here. And then they zoomed in on the hippocampus, which is the main part of the brain involved in memory. And they found that people with the risk version of APOE actually had more stuff leaking through their blood brain barrier um, in this memory center of the brain. You can see again by the lighter colors compared to the dark um, intact barrier in the APOE3, which is like the normal version of APOE, not the risk. And they actually also found that this predicts cognitive decline. So you can see in people who were um, cognitively declining, those are the two little blobs down here, there was even more leakage. Um, so altogether, this provides a pretty convincing story that leaky blood-brain barriers could be something that's tying in to the development of both vascular dementia and Alzheimer's disease. So now onto waste clearance, the last main function that I, that I mentioned. And I haven't mentioned this yet, but it's actually normal for everyone's neurons to produce a little bit of amyloid beta. Um, all of our neurons do this, and you might have read that when you're sleeping, this amyloid can actually get cleared from the brain, and that's true as well. Um, so this basal level of amyloid beta is fine because it's normally cleared pretty efficiently from the brain by either astrocytes taking it up, immune cells clearing it, um, or it actually gets transported through the blood vessels. And another interesting aside here is in the case of familial Alzheimer's disease, so that 5% of cases that is caused by a genetic mutation, what that mutation does is it causes the neurons to pump out a lot more amyloid beta than normal. And that can overload the clearance pathways and actually cause um, the amyloid to aggregate because it's not being cleared very well. So that's kind of what starts the amyloid cascade in the cases of familial Alzheimer's disease, but not in sporadic. Um, to our knowledge, there, there aren't specific mutations causing increased amyloid. So back to our normal case, um, only a bit of amyloid beta is being made, and it can get transported directly across the endothelial cells, or it can be pushed along the smooth muscle cells um, by their pulsations. So when um, they're pulsating to move blood, they can also move amyloid and let it kind of wiggle out of the brain. And when these clearance pathways are disrupted, which could be through endothelial damage, so these endothelial cells aren't working properly to transport the amyloid out, or if you have arterial stiffening, so you're not getting those pulsations needed to wiggle the amyloid out, um, these, these pathways are disrupted and that can lead to the accumulation of amyloid. And specifically when you have arterial stiffening, you can actually get amyloid accumulating in the blood vessels, and this is called cerebral amyloid angiopathy. And this accumulation stiffens the vessels further and it kind of leads into this feedback loop where then you can get plaques forming in the brain because the clearance pathway is even more disrupted. So with all of this evidence, it's really looking like problems with the brain blood vessels, including CBF, which is cerebral blood flow, or BBB, which is the blood brain barrier, may happen before these amyloid plaques. And this is also supported by a lot of the risk factors um, of, of late onset Alzheimer's disease feeding in to altering the brain blood vessels. And this really brings us to an updated hypothesis from the classic amyloid cascade hypothesis, which is the newer two hit hypothesis. And this proposes that an initial hit, um, so initial damage by cardiovascular risk factors, which could be in combination with increasing age and the APOE epsilon four version, um, causes blood brain barrier disruption and or reduce cerebral blood flow. And then these things can then lead to the second hit, which is an increase in amyloid burden. So your neurons are producing more amyloid. And when they produce too much amyloid, that can overload the clearance systems and lead to um, that cascade that ultimately ends in neurodegeneration and dementia. So now comes a time when I dive in to what it actually means to be a cardiovascular risk factor and how this can tie into the picture of Alzheimer's disease and vascular dementia. So let's get right into it. There are a lot of studies that have been done to try to tease apart risk factors for dementia and Alzheimer's disease specifically, and these are the main ones here that keep cropping up, but it's definitely not an exhaustive list. And in the interest of time, I won't go into all of these, but I'm happy to discuss them perhaps later on in the question period or through email or however you'd like to contact me. Um, but my focus today will be this trio of cardiovascular and metabolic risk factors. 
since the talk would probably be about 12 hours long if I tried to unpack everything. But you can note that body mass index and physical activity tie in to blood pressure um, and blood cholesterol. So, so there are links that we will unpack um, about those as well. So starting with blood pressure, many studies have shown that high blood pressure, which is also called hypertension in midlife, so in your 40s to 60s, can increase the risk of developing dementia and Alzheimer's disease specifically later on in life. And I thought it might be useful to go through what blood pressure readings actually mean when you go to the doctors and get your blood pressure read. So when you get this done by your doctor, there are two output numbers. And the first is the systolic blood pressure. And this is the pressure on the blood vessels from your blood um, that happens when your heart is beating. So when it has just sent a bunch of blood through. So that's when your, your vessels are getting the most pressure put against them. And the second measure is diastolic blood pressure. And this is the pressure between beats. So when your vessels are kind of at rest. And these numbers are presented as a ratio. And a normal blood pressure is about 120 over 80. You might have heard. But in the case of high blood pressure or hypertension, when um, blood pressure reaches or passes 140 over 90, there are lots of negative consequences on blood vessel health. So first, the stress from all this pressure on the blood vessel can actually cause tears in the blood vessel. And these tears can leave the blood vessel open to getting stuff deposited in it, like cholesterol, and that's what atherosclerosis is. Also, this pressure can directly affect the endothelial cells and cause endothelial damage. And in response to this extra pressure, the arteries um, or the smooth muscle cells really in the arteries can start to stiffen so that the blood vessel doesn't burst. The um, smooth muscle cells start to stiffen to kind of hold in all the pressure. Um, and we know that this is bad. So linking this back to my discussion earlier about brain blood vessels, we know that endothelial damage can cause the blood brain barrier to leak and the stiffening of arteries can reduce cerebral blood flow or reduce that fine tuned response to what the neurons need and can impair amyloid clearance. So that could be how blood pressure is connected to the development of these types of dementia. So next up, we have blood cholesterol. And really, depending on the age of people used in the study and the measure of cholesterol used, there are actually mixed results about the relationship between cholesterol levels and dementia risk. But it's generally accepted that levels in midlife, just like high blood pressure, are connected to dementia risk later on in life. So to begin to unpack this, um, I'll, I thought I would start with just regular cholesterol. So cholesterol is a fat molecule. And although it gets a bad rap in health guidelines, everyone's always telling you maybe not to eat eggs or to really try to reduce your cholesterol, your body actually needs a certain level of cholesterol to make hormones and build the cells. So since cholesterol is a really fatty molecule, though it needs to be packed into little spheres called lipoproteins to be transported through the blood to get to the cells that need it. So lipoproteins are really um, complex and there are a lot of different kinds as I'm learning because my research is focused on lipoproteins but generally you can divide them into two types the first type on the left here oops being high density lipoproteins or good cholesterol and these particles carry a bunch of different proteins which are indicated by these blobs here and these proteins help these particles to do important jobs, like reducing inflammation, reducing blood clotting, and um, clearing cholesterol from cells, which is a really big one. So low-density lipoproteins, on the other hand, can actually cause cholesterol buildup in cells and be toxic to cells, which can damage endothelial cells specifically. So in the clinic, if you've had your cholesterol measured, there are three different readouts that you, you'd get. So the first is total cholesterol, and this reflects the cholesterol from all of your lipoproteins. Um, and it makes sense that the relationship between total cholesterol and dementia is a bit fuzzy because this measure doesn't really give any insight into the function of the particles or what they're actually doing, good things or bad things. So a more specific measure is HDL cholesterol, which only measures cholesterol from good cholesterol particles. And most studies have found that low levels of HDL in midlife can increase the risk of dementia later on. 
which makes sense because these particles protect blood vessels and low levels could leave the vessels vulnerable. The other measure is LDL cholesterol, which only measures cholesterol from bad cholesterol particles. And in terms of heart disease, it seems that LDL levels are more important than HDL levels in predicting risk. And most studies in the context of Alzheimer's disease have found that high LDL can increase the risk of dementia um, or Alzheimer's disease specifically, and they can also increase how fast cognitive decline happens. So linking all of this back to what we know about the brain blood vessels, this makes sense since high levels of LDL or low levels of HDL can directly lead to endothelial damage because we need that HDL to protect the, vet, the endothelial cells and high levels of LDL can directly damage them. And these cholesterol levels can also lead to atherosclerosis, which I'll unpack next, and that can lead to reduced blood flow and clots. So atherosclerosis is the medical term for a fatty deposit buildup in the arteries. And with endothelial damage, which could be caused by high blood pressure or high levels of LDL, and with this paired with high levels of LDL, you can actually get um, your bad cholesterol depositing in the walls of your arteries. And at first, this is just called a fatty streak when it isn't too extreme yet. But when enough accumulates and cells start to take it up, and then die because they can't handle all of this LDL, it, this fatty streak expands and forms a fibrous plaque, which is a hard blockage of the artery. And if this gets too big, um, it can actually rupture. And that induces a clotting cascade to try to patch up the damage with a clot. So we know that this is a big player behind vascular dementia. It's even illustrated in uh, my hallmarks here. But hopefully I've primed everyone to realize that this can be linked to Alzheimer's disease as well through causing a reduction in blood flow, stiffening the arteries and impairing the amyloid clearance because the arteries have been stiffened. So um, there have also been many studies looking at relationships between atherosclerosis and Alzheimer's disease and most have found that it can worsen cognitive impairment, but there's a lot we still don't understand about this relationship. And a big study was actually just published last year that found that atherosclerosis and Alzheimer's disease actually have overlapping effects on the cells in the brain, one of which is disrupting the synapses, which is those connections between neurons. So obviously I didn't unpack that here, and this is something we're just beginning to appreciate that atherosclerosis um, might actually directly affect the neurons rather than like indirectly cutting off their blood supply and things like that. So we're still learning a lot about this um, every year. So now on to diabetes and I've put simplified here because the relationship between diabetes and Alzheimer's disease is super complicated and the focus of a ton of research um, currently. So a lot of people are really trying to unpack why these two things are related. So to start to unpack this relationship, let's start with a healthy blood vessel. So the main form of nutrients in the blood for cells is called glucose. And glucose can be made when we break, when our body breaks down the food that we eat, it breaks it down into a lot of glucose to be available for the cells to take up. So um, in someone without diabetes, a hormone called insulin lets your cells take up the glucose that they need from the blood, keeping energy production nice and balanced out. But in the case of diabetes, there's either decreased overall insulin, so maybe your pancreas isn't producing much insulin anymore, or your cells just stop responding to insulin, which is called insulin resistance. And this can lead to big fluctuations in the amount of glucose taken up by the cells. Um, and when there's not enough glucose taken up, it's called hypoglycemia. When there's too much, it's called hyperglycemia. And this fluctuation between these states or being in one state or another state for too long can really damage the cells. It really stresses them out having too much glucose or not enough glucose to make energy. And this specifically has been shown to damage blood vessels. And of course, it can also damage um, neurons when they don't have enough energy and cause them to start churning out amyloid beta as well. So with all that I've described so far, this is meant to be a kind of jarring picture of all of the complex web of connections that we see between risk factors. Um, and I'm sure that you can appreciate the complexity of this web um, surrounding these risk factors and dementia. 
And to put all this into a bit of perspective, each of these arrows are huge projects and have taken many years to establish these links. And researchers all over the world are looking into how everything is connected and what we might be able to do to intervene. And I'm sure there are also many connections that haven't been drawn yet, which makes this field a really exciting um, part of research to be involved in. So emerging from the doom and gloom of risk factors, there are ways to intervene and potentially curb dementia if you have a lot of these risk factors. So there have been studies that have tried to intervene for one of the risk factors at a time, like only reducing blood pressure with a medication. And these have had modest results on reducing dementia risk or improving cognition. But there was a need to study whether tackling multiple risk factors at once could make a change. And so in comes the FINGER study, which is the Finnish geriatric intervention study to prevent cognitive impairment. And I know this doesn't really add up to FINGER. I think they just chose the FINGER acronym because it, it's a nice word that, that rings off the, the tongue nicely. Um, and so the researchers that put together this study wanted to know whether targeting multiple risk factors for dementia simultaneously, so at the same time, could improve cognition or delay cognitive decline in older individuals who were at risk of dementia. And in this study, they had an intervention group where they provided a lot of support to reduce risk based on findings from other studies. This in included dietary guidance, so they recommended high fruit and vegetable and whole grain intake, low saturated fat and sugar intake, um, vitamin D supplements, intake of fish, all of these things that we think can um, improve the risk profile for getting dementia. They also outlined a physical activity regimen, which included aerobic and strength exercises, and cognitive training was done through computer programs and social activities were organized for the participants. And they also closely monitored and provided guidance for any of the metabolic, so diabetes or vascular, so hypertension or um, high blood cholesterol, they monitored these very closely and provided advice for managing um, these things. And they compared the 631 individuals in this group to a control group who just got the standard healthcare advice that you would get in Finland. So importantly, all of these participants were aged 60 to 77, so they were in the later stage of life, and they all had risk factors for dementia at the beginning of the study. So after two years of the intervention, the researchers followed up with both groups and they actually found really promising results. They saw higher cognitive scores in all of the areas they tested, so memory, executive function, and hand-eye coordination or psychomotor skills. And this is really exciting. Uh, it means that we can, we can change the course to some extent uh, of developing dementia, even if we are at risk. So this study is ongoing and we'll continue to follow these groups and monitor them over another seven year period to see more long term what kind of effects this has. And also importantly to note, effects of intervention would likely be greater if they happened at midlife to prevent blood vessel damage that may to some extent be irreversible. So if you stop this at midlife, um, it may uh, be even better. So the results of the FINGER trial have excited researchers all around the world, and now there are many studies worldwide looking into the effects of this type of intervention, uh, this multifactorial, like a bunch, interven intervening on a bunch of different things at the same time. And so really, if coming away from this talk, I can stress one thing, it's to take care of your body and prioritize your health, because your whole body health affects your blood vessel health, which then really affects your brain health as well. So a bit less exciting than this global dimension pre dementia prevention study, but still cool in my opinion is my own PhD project, which is currently funded by the Alzheimer's Society. So my project is focused on good cholesterol, um, which I talked a bit about earlier. And I kind of glossed over this, but these particles are really complicated. They carry a bunch of different proteins, like I mentioned. And these proteins drive different jobs, like I mentioned as well. So some proteins can drive the particles to reduce inflammation. Some can drive the particles to reduce clotting. Some can drive the particles to uh, increase cholesterol clearance from cells. And importantly, the certain proteins on HDL can be very different between people. And we have a bunch of different types of HDL particles in our own blood as well. And the composition or the types of proteins on the HDL 
give insight into how the HDL functions, and it may be a better measure of overall the protection that the blood vessels are getting from the HDL that you have. So as I described earlier, the standard HDL cholesterol assay in the clinic measures cholesterol from all HDL particles, which when you take into consideration how complex and diverse these particles are, it's actually a pretty rough measurement. And recently, a specific protein on HDL has gained some attention in the world of heart health research, and that's APOE. So some evidence suggests that when APOE is on HDL, these particles are really good at reducing arterial stiffening and driving cholesterol clearance from cells, which are really important functions. And APOE may also sound familiar from earlier in this talk when I mentioned that a version of APOE is the main genetic risk factor for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So this protein is actually um, what is made by the APOE gene. So the APOE gene, that genetic risk factor, is a blueprint to make this protein. And when you have the risk version of APOE, this protein is actually a bit different. So my project is really taking a new perspective on known risk factors and trying to add another arrow to that web of connections. So some of my research questions include, can a more specific measure of HDL, so not just general HDL cholesterol, but actually HDL with APOE, could that better predict who might develop dementia or who has damage in their brain blood vessels? And I'm also interested in whether having the risk version of APOE can decrease the amount of these particles uh, of HDL with APOE, or could it decrease their protective function because the protein is a little bit different? So to begin looking into this, I'll be using banked blood from people with and without dementia and with and without the risk versions of APOE and measuring the APOE in HDL or measuring cholesterol just from HDL containing APOE. And I'll be looking for relationships with markers of cerebrovascular damage, diagnosis of dementia, and APOE genotype. So another question I'm trying to address in my work is whether there are specific functions of HDL or HDL containing APOE that protect brain blood vessels. And since we can't get down to this level of detail in humans, we can't look at um, how one type of particle interacts with a certain type of cell. We can't zoom in that close in living people. I'm working to build a model of brain blood vessels in a dish. So, here we go. Um, these are some pictures I took of different cell types um, that I've described in the talk. So these are astrocytes in real life. They're just plated on a plastic dish. You can see their nice star shape um, morphology that kind of looks like the graphic here. Then I have parasites, um, which kind of look elongated, sort of like the smooth muscle cell cartoon that I had earlier. And then endothelial cells that when they get nice and close together, they form this cobblestone-like pattern. And what I'm doing with these cells is putting them into models. So this model is called a transwell system. And what this is, is at the bottom here, this is a membrane with a bunch of little holes in it so things can pass through. So what I'll do is I'll put the endothelial cells on top and then put the parasites and astrocytes on the bottom so they can contact the endothelial cells through all the holes. And using this system, I can actually measure how good the barrier is. So I can test when HDL is put in this system, does the barrier improve? And that's kind of like a model of the blood-brain barrier. We're also working to build microfluidic chips. And what this really means is it's a little chip where you can flow small amounts of liquid through. So in this system, we don't have flow over the blood brain barrier, um, which it would be what happens in real life. So this model is closer to what happens in real life, but we're still troubleshooting, trying to develop this and make sure we get consistent results. And the HDL that I use is actually um, I can isolate it from human blood, um, which is a really cool thing that, it, that I'm happy to discuss in the question period. I'm aware that I'm going a bit over time. So with that, I will thank everyone for listening and I'm happy to take any questions. I think Avery just wants to go over a couple of slides before we open up the floor to questions. So thank you everyone for listening. Thanks so much, Ellen. So feel free to start um, typing your questions into the chat box. Just wanted to let you know about some of our upcoming webinars. Next week, we're going to be presenting on communication changes and some practical communication strategies. 
And then the week following that, we'll be discussing um, the skills you need to respond to common challenges that families face at key points in the dementia journey, such as getting a diagnosis or accessing home support. And as well, if you want to watch any of our recorded videos, this video as well will be recorded and posted on our website. You can see the link there. And um, Daisy has just put some helpful links into the chat box. Um, so we'll be sharing some resources you might be interested in. So in particular, our annual research focus newsletter is called A Focus on Research. And the 2021 version will be released next week. And this year's edition actually features more information about Ellen's research. So really encourage you to follow us on social media um, and you'll be notified when it's released. And if you want to go to the next slide. Yep. Go. Perfect. And as well, these are just the numbers for our First Link Dementia Helpline. Um, so if you have any questions um, about living with dementia or interested in any of our programs, like our telesupport groups or Minds in Motion Online, please don't hesitate to call. Um, and as well, Daisy will just be sharing um, an evaluation survey for the presentation. So if you want to fill that out at the end, that would be wonderful. We love hearing your feedback to make sure that our um, presentations are as effective as possible. Thanks so much. So now we'll dive into some questions. All right, I'm just going to stop my share to get all my windows in order here. <laughs> sure, whatever works best for you. So let me know when you're ready. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So our first question for you, Ellen, is how do we ensure a healthier HDL generally? Is this affected by diet? Um, this is an area of a lot of ongoing debate and research. Um, so we think that uh, the healthy HDL is driven by the proteins that it carries, but we're actually not sure what drives um, what, whether some people have more of the, the beneficial proteins on HDL. So it's a fantastic question. As far as I know, it's not, um, I mean, I'm sure if you had a diet super high in saturated fats and, and super, super high in cholesterol, you would be leaning more toward um, more LDL, uh, so more bad cholesterol compared to HDL. So, um, but in, in, in terms of like something that you could eat to ensure a, a healthier HDL population in your blood, I'm, I'm actually not sure on that. It's a good question and probably um, an exciting area of research. Wonderful, thank you. Another question is, are there any studies involving actual participants that are examining cholesterol and dementia? Yes, there are a, a lot uh, of studies doing this. And I'm actually using banked samples from real people. So real people have donated their blood to um, banks at the um, Center for Alzheimer's Disease and Related Disorders, the CARD clinic at UBC Hospital. So I'm actually partnered with them to get bank samples from real participants um, to do these kind of measures um, in the blood as well. Wonderful. Another question, just wanted to clarify that the familial link is responsible for only 5% of cases. So I think they might be interested in the difference between familial Alzheimer's disease and then APOE and the other genetic risk factors for sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So is the 5% including all of that? So the 5% doesn't include the APOE. The APOE is a genetic risk factor. It's not like a causative genetic mutation. Whereas in the familial cases at about 5%, those mutations are causative. So if you have those mutations, you're very, very likely to get Alzheimer's. But if you have APOE, you're not pre, the, the risk version of APOE, you're not predestined to get Alzheimer's. It's just increases your risk a little bit, which may be because it makes your blood brain barrier a little bit leakier. Um, and we're, we're trying to unpack or unpack why it really increases the risk. That's a lot. It's a lot of research going into that. Wonderful. Thank you. OK, another question I see here. Having high LDL since childhood seeming to be the baseline, would that determine a higher risk of developing dementia? From the research that I've read, it seems that high LDL since childhood, like all the way through midlife, would increase the risk of developing dementia, which could be through the development of atherosclerosis or things that could reduce the blood flow to the brain. Yeah, I've, yeah. 
sorry. Oh, sorry. I was going to say, I see a, a private um, question to me here from Guy, and he's asking, um, are egg whites better than whole eggs, and should we avoid whole eggs? So I anticipated that this was going to be a question. So I, I did some research into it, and there's actually mixed findings. So one group did a really big study using, I think, like six or 7,000 participants and found that the consumption of eggs didn't directly link to, to dementia or any of these negative outcomes. But then another study that I think was a smaller sample size found that it did. So it's kind of unclear. I don't think eggs will be the make or break into whether you're developing dementia or not. I think eating eggs in moderation is fine because as, as I mentioned, your body does need cholesterol to function properly. So I wouldn't just completely cut out anything that has cholesterol from your diet, but eating anything in moderation, I think is, is totally fine. That's great. And a, a similar line to the cholesterol questions, how does cholesterol medication help? So are there findings that it may um, impact your risk of developing dementia if you take cholesterol medication? Yeah, so there's been a lot of research into statins, which are known to um, modify the, the cholesterol in people's blood. And these haven't been really promising in, in totally wiping out dementia. Um, it doesn't seem that it'll be that easy as just treating people with statins and then their cholesterol profile is better and then they won't get dementia. The, the link isn't really that straightforward. But there are some new trials going on right now with different types of um, cholesterol modifying drugs that may be promising in terms of preventing dementia later on. So this is an ongoing area of research and definitely an interesting question. Thanks, Ellen. Another question. I love how many questions we're getting. It's clear that it's a really interesting topic for everyone. Um, what if a person has high antibodies slash inflammation? Yes, yeah, so inflammation is something that I didn't dive into this talk, but that is a huge area of, of research in, in the field of Alzheimer's disease. So it seems that high inflammation all the time, um, which is not necessarily linked to, to high antibodies, but high inflammation, if your body is stressed out, which could be from actual stress or could be from illness, that can lead to problems going on in your brain as well and actually the neurons pumping out amyloid as well. So inflammation, we're unsure whether it's like a cause or a consequence of Alzheimer's disease, um, but there are definitely lots of, of relationships there that certainly not my area of expertise. Um, but as far as I know, you should try to reduce overall baseline inflammation. Don't get too stressed out. And that's something I have to remind myself frequently. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> okay, another question is, is there a test for having a leaky brain? No, um, not really. So we're working to develop tools that might allow us to assess whether someone has a leaky brain. These include in that paper I was talking about where they had the tracer that they could look through MRI and see if stuff was leaking through. That's a pretty invasive test, though. It requires doing a lot of of imaging and you know getting a tracer injected into you. Not everyone wants to do that, but we are looking into um, things that may be in your blood or in your cerebrospinal fluid that might reflect having a leaky barrier. And one of these is um, it's a marker for pericyte damage. So pericytes are those cells that support uh, and reinforce the blood-brain barrier. And when these cells are damaged, they release um, things that we can actually measure in the um, cerebrospinal fluid. So this is emerging as something that may be a useful tool, but so far there's no quick and easy blood test to see if you have a leaky blood-brain barrier. Wonderful, thank you so much, Ellen. So I'm not seeing any more questions. I'll give one more moment. I know we're coming to the end of our time today, but if there's any last questions, feel free to get them into the chat box. And we've also popped that um, evaluation survey link again. So if you have a chance to fill that out at the end of the presentation, that's incredibly helpful. It helps us determine what sort of webinars to um, provide in the future. And as well, if you have any questions, you can always get in touch with um, Daisy and I at research at alzheimersbc.org. And thank you everyone for your, your kind comments in the chat. I'm, I'm glad everyone hopefully learned something or, or was entertained at least by, by the presentation today. So thank you all for, for coming. Thanks so much.
And um, yeah, we'll be posting this recording. Um, I see a question about, can we get a copy of the slides presented? So we'll have the recording there, but if you did want a copy of the slides, we might be able to make that happen if you email us at uh, research at alzheimerbc.org. We can um, connect with Ellen and, and with her permission, share um, some of these slides. Yeah, I, I spend a lot of time making all the, the little graphics, so I'm totally happy to, to share them with everyone. I would love to. Sure, so just feel free to email us and we can uh, connect you with those slides. Otherwise, the recording will be up on our YouTube page in a few days. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone, for attending. Thank you so much, Ellen. And uh, Ellen, we're just, I'm just seeing a, a ton of um, comments rolling in that people really found this uh, informative and enjoyable and was really helpful to so many. So thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. It's, it's great to be able to share um, what's going on in my head all the time <laughs> with some people. So I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thanks so much. So we can hang around for a few moments, but we'll end the webinar now. Um, but if there's any last minute questions, we can stay on for a few minutes. I see a question about blood pressure. Um, I am certainly not a blood pressure expert at all. I'm, I'm not a, phys a trained physician or anything. But I see some cardiologists say that having blood pressure above 120 over 80 is still acceptable. But according to the information you provided, even for seniors, um, blood pressure should be 120 over 80 to reduce risks. Um, so I am certainly not qualified to give guidelines on what blood pressure is acceptable, and you should absolutely um, check with your physician about that. This is just some kind of information I found as I was digging through more of the research world, not even really diving into the clinical world. So definitely um, your doctor is more right than I am, <laughs> for sure. And I see a question here, are there any studies I could get involved in as a child of someone living with dementia? Um, I'm, I'm sure there are. Um, I'm not 100% sure on which one specifically, like I, I couldn't ring off anyone, any, but if you would like to get in contact with me, I can put you in contact with, with people who might know. I know there are a lot of um, dementia clinics looking for um, family members of people with dementia um, for collecting, collecting samples for studies like mine. So I could put you in contact with them. Yeah, so feel free to email us at research at alzheimerbc.org and we can connect with Ellen. And um, we're also connected to different studies that are happening that we can share as well. Another question was, if the brain already has 20 plus amyloid protein, does it increase the risk of having dementia later? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by 20 plus amyloid protein, um, but any amyloid accumulation in the brain would suggest an increased risk of dementia later and perhaps that that um, cascade is beginning, um, as I mentioned. So um, best to just reduce all the risk factors that you can if you have detected um, amyloid in the brain. And I have a question here again from Guy. How many years do you think it will be before definite conclusions will be available? That's a fantastic question. Um, research progresses at a really slow pace. Um, I'm finding this in my, in my PhD studies as well because there are a lot of things that we need to unpack and understand and, and control in our studies um, and, you know, doing a research study in a group of one participants might give you a different result in a group of another participants. And so it's a lot of time kind of trying to tease apart all these little nuances. And so definite conclusions um, about risk factors, I mean, they're churning out um, studies all the time, but I, I'm not sure actually when, when hard set conclusions will be made. It's kind of I don't know. <laughs> it's it's a, it's a slow pace, but we are making a ton of progress, and we've come a long way as I kind of unpack today, especially with those intervention studies. Wonderful. Well, I'm thinking it might be time to draw things to a close here. Thanks so much for everyone who stayed stayed on and and asked some additional questions. Um, so I'll end it here. Um, but thank you so much for tuning in today.